So now we're going to get an update on um, SRP from uh, Bart Van Ash of Fusion IO. Okay, just figured out how the remote control works. So during this session, I will tell you more about what my involvement is with SRP, a um, little bit more about storage APIs, what the Linux kernel is, and what the acronyms BlockMQ and SCSIMQ stand for, and also what the relationship is with, between the SRP initiator driver and the SCSIMQ MQ project. As uh, most of you probably know, I'm uh, maintaining the open source uh, Linux SRP initiator driver and also the SCST SRP uh, target driver. Uh, professionally, I'm working for Fusion.io and the Ion team. Ion team is an all flash, high availability shared storage appliance. The appliance um, supports different protocols, iSCSI, fiber channel, and SRP. Uh, focus of the appliance is on uh, low latency and high bandwidth. And it's mostly used for um, accelerating database applications and also for uh, virtual desktop ap applications. Uh, these workloads benefit most from low latency. As you know, flash memory uh, provides low latency and high bandwidth. Uh, focus of RDMA technology is also on low latency and high bandwidth. And that makes RDMA a very interesting technology for remote access to flash memory. Uh, regarding storage APIs, I'd like to start with an example. An uh, example that comes from KVM. KVM is the kernel-based virtual machine and a hypervisor for Linux. Um, the KVM hypervisor allows guests virtual machines to access resources on the host uh, for like uh, networking and block storage and to allow that uh, kvm guests use a paralyzed para virtualized driver the name uh, of that driver is virtual block or virtual scuzzy virtual block is the oldest one it was added in 2007 to the linux kernel by um, rusty russell that driver provides a block device API to the guests and communicates over the hypervisor bus to the host. Uh, what the KVM maintainers found out over time is that they were adding more and more features to the driver, uh, like um, disk identification and whether write record supported, all features that are already present in the SCSI protocol. So after a few years, they decided uh, to switch from the block driver to a SCSI driver. Uh, they um, created a Vertigo SCSI driver and merged it in the Linux kernel. So the motivation why the driver Virtual SCSI was added to the Linux kernel is interesting. So it's a full explanation of motivation why the uh, SCSI um, protocol is, was uh, useful uh, for guests. Actually, it means that uh, KVM authors that they needed um, several different features of the SCSI protocol, like multi-LAN uh, support and um, disk identification and so on. In other words, a storage API it must provide more functionality than just reading and writing blocks. There's a real need for the functionality that's present in the SCSI protocol. If we now have a look at the SRP protocol and how it relates to the uh, SCSI, then we see that the SRP protocol, all it does is to define a transport layer for the SCSI protocol. It defines how to communicate uh, SCSI commands. That means that the SRP protocol um, offers all functionality that's present in uh, SCSI. Uh, of course, uh, it allows to read and write data blocks, but it also allows to read the capacity of a uh, single storage volume. Comment queuing is, is supported. That's a very important uh, feature for hiding latency of communication links. Multiple LUNs are supported. That means once a connection has been established, uh, that um, multiple storage volumes can be defined, and each of these can be addressed separately. 
And for each of these volumes, called the LUN and the SCSI world, um, this can be identified. Uh, the identification string can be queried. Uh, it's possible to query whether uh, which kind of caching is used. Uh, then provisioning information can be queried. Uh, something else that has been added recently as a SCSI command, and that also was um, mentioned in the NVMe session, that's uh, atomic writes. So today, uh, database applications um, with a traditional uh, storage device, um, they have to write all data twice in order to realize a transaction. Uh, that's because uh, it must be guaranteed that if a power failure occurs, uh, that uh, all data um, is on disk and that it can be recovered properly. Uh, with the new command, atomic write, uh, that the command guarantees if a power failure occurs that either all data has, uh, has been written or none of it has been written. That allows to make database software a lot faster because data has to be written only once instead of two times. Especially with low latency um, storage like a solid state drive, that's very important. Uh, something, another aspect of the SCSI uh, standard is VAI, VMware API for Array Integration. These are the right same command, unmap, atomic test and set, xcopy. There's also end-to-end -end data integrity. For enterprise workloads, it's very important to guarantee that the data that was generated by an application um, is written on a solid state drive without uh, having been modified. Uh, that's what uh, the 10 a stand, a PI standard defines. There are also persistent reservations. If multiple independent servers are accessing a, a single shared a storage server, then it's important that only one of these servers at a time um, accesses or modifies the data. Uh, that's what persistent reservations will allow. Uh, there's also asymmetric logical unit access. That's another feature for uh, multipath where this, uh, that allows a storage uh, server to define uh, which part is optimal and to communicate that knowledge to the initiator. Uh, my employer, Frisionary IO, is actively involved in the NCT10 committee uh, and actively helps standardizing uh, new commands, SCSI commands. And, well, uh, we are also working on helping to optimize um, performance of um, the Linux kernel and storage drivers in the Linux kernel. So in the Linux kernel, there are two different APIs um, or two different approaches uh, for creating a storage driver. Uh, one of them is the block layer, and when uh, creating a, a driver on top of the block layer, um, it's possible to achieve up to 3 million um, IOPS. However, when using the other API, uh, the SCSI driver API, then only 1 million IOPS can be achieved. Um, it's for uh, 4K. Yeah. So that means that uh, for anyone who wants to develop a driver for a high-end storage device uh, that uh, you have to make the choice between either the high performance of the block layer or the rich functionality of the SCSI stack. Uh, that's annoying. So that's a problem that's widely recognized inside the Linux kernel community. Uh, about a year ago, uh, the block layer maintainer, Jens Exbo, uh, started working on optimizing the block layer further. Hence the multi-queue block layer project, uh, abbreviated as block MQ. Uh, that, uh, it's, it's a re-implementation of the block layer and that uh, approach eliminates lock contention. It has been uh, merged recently in the Linux kernel in version 3.13. I think that was uh, the end of last year. 
And the next step is to use the same approach and the Linux SCSI core. That's the SCSI multi queue project. And Shishin Yu has asked uh, Christoph uh, Helwig, a well-known uh, kernel developer, uh, to start working on that uh, or to realize that he's living in Austria that's close to where Bernard is living. So I can have tried to make that more clear with a few diagrams. Um, when using the traditional Linux block layer, if uh, two different processes are using uh, the same storage medium, uh, these processes uh, are running in user space. They use a single file system to access the block device. And then the file system uses a single queue uh, to communicate with the block driver. So that means um, that the request queue is uh, protected by a lock um, to make it um, safe to access it concurrently by different processes. So that means that um, when different processes are issuing I.O., that lock contention is triggered on that uh, request queue. And that's an important performance bottleneck. With the multi-queue block layer, however, uh, between the file system and the block driver, there are multiple of these queues. Uh, there's namely one such queue for each uh, CPU. Uh, that means that all lock contention is gone, but that's not the only change. Uh, there is a, um, with the multi-queue block core, uh, a second layer of queuing has been introduced, the so-called hardware queues. These are the queues between block driver and the hardware device. And that's a second important optimization because that means uh, with um, storage device that supports MSIX, uh, that um, the I.O. completions can be processed by multiple CPU cores simultaneously. So these two changes together, uh, one request queue per CPU and multiple hardware queues, these allow to, or these make the Linux block layer a lot faster. So most of this, uh, most of what has been mentioned on this slide uh, has already been mentioned. Uh, just the last bullet. I'm not sure how familiar uh, most of you are with uh, Linux um, file slash proc slash interrupts. So because if you load, for example, the MLX4 driver, uh, then in that file you can see that uh, multiple MLX4 IB um, interrupts are created. That's just an example uh, that shows that the driver is already able to support MSIX and that it already creates today multiple of these MES, MSIX vectors. That means that uh, when using um, RDMA over InfiniBand and with that driver, it's possible already today to spread the workload over multiple CPU cores. Uh, regarding the SCSI uh, multi queue project. So, the traditional Linux SCSI core is implemented as a block driver. The SCSI MQ project, that means uh, mod replacing the SCSI core um, and by a, a new implementation based on the multi queue block layer. Uh, today, the SCSI MQ implementation has one request queue per CPU and per LAN. Um, a prototype is already available, has been uh, published on the Linux SCSI mailing list. And with that implementation, I ran a few measurements. What I noticed is that with the new implementation, uh, there is a very significant uh, reduction in CPU usage. It's um, more than three times uh, less uh, of what, what it was before. When using, um, I've also been modifying the SRP initiator to use multiple RDMA channels between initiator and target instead of just one channel. Uh, that caused, a, caused about twice as much IOPS and also higher bandwidth. So the SCSI MQ, MQ project, it's work in progress. 
prototype has been implemented, uh, has been uh, published, sorry, but there are several open issues. It's already possible with that prototype to implement multiple hardware queues, but these are not yet uh, integrated with the block MQ layer. But that's something that uh, will be addressed during the next weeks. Hardware queues. Uh, these are today per LUN instead of per SCSI host. That, and the queue capacity is defined per SCSI host. That means that the SCSI layer itself cannot detect or cannot do the detection of whether a queue is full or not, uh, but that it has to done in the SCSI layer instead of the block layer. Also today, there's a tag pool uh, per hardware queue instead of and there's, uh, the SCSI uh, core only defines one such hardware queue. That means that today there is a, a contention uh, on that uh, tag pool on NUMA systems. Uh, well, but um, this presentation was prepared last week, and this morning I noticed that a patch has been published to address just this issue. So you can see that uh, progress is, uh, the project is making progress quickly. So if you would like to uh, read more about one of the topics that has been mentioned in this presentation, I have mentioned a few references here, some about KVM and the uh, BlockMQ and SCSI MQ driver. There's also a link to a presentation of a colleague about the IO memory uh, technology in which it is explained, um, more details are explained about the atomic rights and how it helps to accelerate databases. There's a presentation about Matthias Björling, uh, the person who has been working together with Jens Exbo on the block multi queue layer. Also, a link to a presentation by Robert Elliott from HP about atomic rights and reads. Yeah. And a link to the patches for SCSI multi queue. There's one last comment I would like to make. That's about um, the. SCST and SRP. So when I st uh, start explaining that we are using SCST and SRP, uh, people often uh, make a comment. There are also other storage tags. There are also other uh, block layer protocols. Why have you just chosen this combination? Well, as you probably know, the, in the shared storage world, there's a lot of competition. And um, we have to make sure that our device is competitive. And what we noticed is that for the Fusion IO um, SSD uh, uh, storage systems, uh, that the combination of SEST and SRP, that it, uh, for us, results in the lowest latency and highest bandwidth. There are certainly other applications where other combinations work better, but I think that's a topic for the next presentation. So, uh, that's all I had to tell about uh, SRP and the SCSI MQ project. Are there any questions? What's the scheduler to schedule the IOs across multiple queues for all the block devices across the class? Uh, today, with the block MQ project, um, there is. Okay, we'll show the slide. Could you repeat the question, please? So the question was, if there are multiple, multiple queues, how are these queues, uh, how is IO scheduled over the different queues? So there are two layers of queuing with a top level layer, there's one request queue per CPU, and then there's a, the mapping is easy. IO is just scheduled um, to, onto the queue that is local to the CPU. And that's why it's possible to eliminate, eliminate locking in that layer. And the other layer, the bottommost layer, the hardware queues, um, these are typically limited, or there's a limited number of these queues. And then it's a real uh, challenge to choose the right queues to get uh, performance as optimal. And the uh, block MQ layer, there is a fixed map um, where for each uh, CPU number is mapped to a hardware queue number uh, that's uh, fixed and that has to be provided by the uh, block driver itself.
So the, it's a challenge to choose that mapping uh, properly. And I think uh, good uh, advice for choosing that mapping is to make sure that the number of the amount of communication between uh, CPU sockets is minimal. Does that answer your question? Or? Um, well, I haven't seen any starvation in the test I ran myself, and the uh, kind of performance I had noticed was above one million IOPS, but, and that was on our very limited hardware. It was just on a target system with um, uh, one single CPU with four, uh, four cores. Uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah.